The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Sensational stories and pulp culture aren't always regarded as worthy of historical scrutiny. But tonight, podcaster Sarah Marshall explains why they are and why you might just be wrong about some headline-grabbing events of the past. First up, as many marked Holocaust Remembrance Day earlier this week, Steve Pakin talks to author Jonathan Friedland about his book, The Escape Artist, which chronicles the harrowing and heroic efforts of Rudolf Verba to warn the world about the Nazi death camps. It's Friday, April 21st, and that's ahead on the agenda. You have likely never heard of Rudolf Verba, even by his given name, Walter Rosenberg. But a new book rightly aims to change that. It's called The Escape Artist, The Man Who Broke Out of Auschwitz to Warn the World. It's written by Jonathan Friedland, a journalist and weekly columnist for The Guardian, and he joins us now on the line from London, UK. Jonathan, it's a great pleasure to meet you. I, I read the book. It's an extraordinary book. It tells an incredible tale. And let's just set up our conversation with uh, a couple of pictures here, because, of course, there are too many people who don't know enough about this time period in history. This would be a shot of one of the many chaotic scenes of hundreds of people uh, soon to be killed at the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp complex. And one of the people who arrived at that place many, many years ago is this man, who changed his name ultimately to Rudolf Verba, just 17 years old when he arrived at Auschwitz in a cattle car, stuffed in there. They tattooed his arm with number 44070, and he spent nearly two years there. Now, let's start with this. Give us a sense about the kind of death, mayhem, and violence that would have been a daily part of Walter's life back in the late, in the mid-1940s. Well, as you say, Steve, uh, death and destruction all around for the 17-year-old uh, Walter. We, we, we'll call him Rudy, I think, or Rudolf Verbo, because that was the name that would accompany him most of his life. When he arrived, he saw straight away that this was a kind of sprawling metropolis of death. Uh, there were casual beatings handed out of the slightest provocation from the guards there, from the henchmen of the guards, SS men armed with automatic weapons, which they would fire off if anyone attempted to sort of even break out of line, uh, forced into slave labor, um, back-breaking work where people would fall where they stood uh, under the conditions, often under the whip of one of those effectively slave drivers, people who would drop dead from disease or starvation. And that was even before uh, Rudy would understand that there was a larger process of industrialized killing going on. Uh, it took him a, a few, a matter of weeks for that penny to drop. Now, of course, we know a, a, a notoriously associate Auschwitz with the gas chambers. That was not known to anyone on the outside or even to new arrivals. It took time for that penny to drop to realize there was systematized murder going on in this place hour by hour every single day. The Nazis had, ironically enough, a place called Canada, which um, put a different picture on the place. And I'm going to read an excerpt from your book just to explain to people what went on in quote unquote Canada. Canada, you write, was another country and another world, a land of plenty where stomachs were full, the wine was fine, and the menu forever packed with exotic delights. It was a place of sensual pleasures, of crisp sheets, silk stockings, and soft plush furs. There was wealth in every denomination, gold and silver, diamonds and pearls. It might have been the richest, most luxurious place in Europe, and it was in Auschwitz. And let's also bring a picture up of that. There's a snapshot of the place they called Canada. How did it get that name, Jonathan? Canada was a, an area, a uh, part of the camp. Um, it got that name because, as you said just there, reading that extract, this was a place where uh, luxury goods uh, of all, uh, of every possibility, of every kind, were piled up high. 
Um, and that was because these were the possessions uh, of those people who arrived at the camp. Uh, they brought with them bags uh, with their, uh, you know, with their worldly goods. But if they had anything of value, they brought it because they thought, who knows, this may be an insurance policy, this may be a bribe. Why called Canada? Because Canada, it turns out, in the central European imagination of the middle of the 20th century, was associated uh, with a kind of land where the streets were paved with gold, uh, a land uh, flowing with milk and honey, if you like. Lots of people from uh, you know, the Czechoslovakia or Hungary had moved to Canada in the 1930s or 20s and made their fortune there and written back to their families and said, you know, Canada is the is a place of unimaginable wealth. And so therefore it became a nickname for the part of the camp where all these possessions were stacked up. And uh, our character, Rudy, was there working, again, a slave labor, but his job was to sort out those big bundles and cases that you flashed up in that photograph that were uh, you know, stripped from new arrivals in Auschwitz. And they were piled up high in warehouses and sorted blankets, pots, pans, clothes, shoes, famously children's shoes, um, but also if there were objects that were found hidden in the lining of uh, the hem of a skirt or, uh, you know, underneath the, the fly of a pair of trousers, you know, people might sew in a diamond or a wedding ring or even a bundle of dollar bills stashed inside a toothpaste tube. The people, the sorters, fellow prisoners in Auschwitz uh, in Canada would find them. It turns out Rudy had many different jobs while he was in Auschwitz, and most of them far more dangerous and death-defying than the time he worked in Canada. What was the significance, ultimately, of his having had so many different jobs in that place? Well, it meant that he was able, through being bounced around uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau as a slave in so many places and for so long. You mentioned at the top there that he was there for nearly two years. It meant that he had an extraordinary kind of panoramic view of Auschwitz-Birkenau and its operations. He more or less saw at first hand the entire system from the moment a train pulled in, a transport full of Jews brought in from all points of Europe, you know, France, Germany, Poland, hung, uh, eventually Hungary, but um, uh, you know Belgium. Uh, he would see those trains come in, but he would see every stage of the process right up until uh, up up uh, uh, to the doors of the gas chamber itself. He never was one of those uh, Jewish prisoners who was forced to work in the gas chambers themselves. There were some so-called Zonderkommando who were forced to you know, remove the bodies from the gas chambers. He was, didn't do that, but he saw everything else. And it meant that he was a kind of 360 degree witness of what happened in Auschwitz. He had an unusually wide knowledge of what happened in that camp. Even his starting point, I mean, he did a few jobs in the in, in what would become known as Buna, the industrial site where some of Germany's biggest known corporate names uh, were building a massive industrial plant. He worked there for a while, building that, back-breaking work, carrying bags of cement on his back, but was then moved later to Canada, where we described, and that was a really important place for, for in his journey, if you like, because... At first, he didn't understand what all these piles of clothes, what they meant. Steadily, the penny dropped when he realized there are more clothes here, there are more objects here than there are people, fellow prisoners around. And he's realized, for example, that he could see men's clothes and women's clothes, but also children's clothes, and yet there were no children. And slowly, and he would later say with some embarrassment, it took him a while to to. to draw the of what we now think of as the obvious conclusion, he realized that this was a place, unlike any that had existed in human history before, this was a place of industrialized murder. There were reason why there was more stuff in Canada than there were people, he realized, was that people were being brought to this place to be killed. Let's do another excerpt from the book. If the Nazi plot to destroy the Jews relied on keeping the intended victims entirely ignorant of their fate, to ensure they were lambs, not scattered deer, 
then the first step towards thwarting that murderous ambition was to inform the Jews of the capital sentence that the Nazis had passed on them. Somebody had to escape and sound the alarm, issuing the warning that Auschwitz meant death. Around the time he turned 18 years old in September 1942, as he watched the SS decide with a flick of a finger who would live and who would die, Rudolf concluded that person should be him. So he decides that he wants to escape, a place that no Jew had ever escaped from. I appreciate the fact that you don't want to give all the details away here, uh, but can you give us a hint of how he did it? Yeah, I mean, I will. And just before that, I mean, that, in that extract, it's crucial to realize that the motive, what was prompting uh, Rudy was this realization that the people who were arriving with these bags and clothes were doing that because they had no idea of what fate awaited them. They thought they were arriving for new lives in the East. And that was what may enable this process to be smooth for the Nazis. The very fact that the victims were ignorant of their fate, that's why they would have be relatively compliant. And so, as that extract showed, Rudy came to the conclusion that the only way of slowing down this Nazi killing machine was to inform the victims. And so he decides it should be him. He he had uh, already had this impulse to be uh, you know, difficult as a prisoner. He tried to escape at different stages, even before he got to Auschwitz. But now he had this new motive, and he looked around and together with his escape partner, Fred Wetzler, who was from the same hometown in Slovakia, the two of them came up with this ingenious uh, thought, which was others, others had tried, other Jews had tried to escape uh, Auschwitz before. Um, they had done it by often trusting their fate to, you know, bribing an SS guard and so on. Those had not worked. They spotted a loophole in the Nazi defences. Now, this was not a physical gap. There was no hole in a fence somewhere that you could climb through. Rather, they saw that the Nazi protocol uh, that uh, was enforced was enforced without variation. And they came up with, and I'm going to hold back the exact method because I want people to read the story, but they realised there was this gap, in the, the this flaw in the Nazi method, and the, they worked out a way that if they could somehow hide within the camp for three days and three nights, uh, evading detection, uh, which was no mean feat, there was a way, if they could just do that, there was a way to get out. Now, that was, you know, it sounds hard, but it was even harder than you could possibly imagine to be hidden inside for three days, three nights. When they knew they would be looked for, the Nazis did not want anyone escaping that camp, partly for the reason we just mentioned a moment ago, which is they didn't want word of Auschwitz to escape, to leak out with any escapee. They didn't want the world to know. And therefore, a couple of thousand SS men, together with their bloodhounds and sniffer dogs, were searching for anyone who might try and hide in the camp. And, you know, Rudy and his... Escape partner Fred Betzler, the two of them were, were, had picked up all kinds of advice and tips from fellow prisoners, including, for example, that they, if you doused a particular kind of Soviet tobacco in gasoline, in petrol, and then dried it, those leaves, that dust of tobacco, gave off a scent that the uh, SS Nazi dogs found repellent and would they would not come near. That, that was the level of preparation that, you know, then just uh, 19 years old by this time, uh, Rudy and uh, together with Fred, they went to huge lengths. They were meticulous in their preparation. And in April 1944, uh, incredibly, this, uh, di this feat that, you know, all but no person had ever achieved before a Jewish prisoner to engineer their own escape with the help only of their fellow prisoners uh, uh, to get out of Auschwitz and stay out and successfully make their way to freedom. Virtually unprecedented for a Jewish prisoner to do that. And, uh, uh, and yet Fred and Rudy together pulled that off. Now, as you tell us in the book, they very much wanted to get out because they wanted to get the word out about what was going on at Auschwitz and Birkenau and the systematic murder of Jews that was taking part there. And, and they managed to do that. They reached home in Slovakia. They dictate to somebody what turns out to be a 32-page bombshell report 
forensic detail from memory of Auschwitz's killing machine, translated into a variety of languages. Uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's put this sketch up here. This is something that, by memory, uh, Rudy managed to describe uh, to the people doing the report. This is essentially the, uh, the outline, the, the layout of, of Auschwitz. And the report does... It does get out there. It ends up on American President Franklin Roosevelt's desk. How did he respond, for example? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing to think of, this sort of teenage boy from Slovakia who already has pulled off this improbable feat, becoming one of the very first Jews ever to escape from Auschwitz. Uh, he and Fred get out the word out. The, as you say, the report is smuggled out hand to hand. Remember, you know, this was occupied Europe. It couldn't just be published. It had to be smuggled out and does, uh, you know, across borders secretly through a whole variety of very elaborate and improbable characters, which I chart in the book. It gets to, as you say, the desk of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, also Winston Churchill in London, uh, Pope Pius in Rome. And Fred, uh, Rudy's assumption always had been the second word was out, then, of course, the world would act. How could they do anything else but uh, respond? And yet, um, and, uh, and by then, the report had been attached uh, to a plea from Jewish leaders around the world to uh, uh, do take action by bombing the railway tracks to Auschwitz. The thinking was, if Auschwitz is a factory of death, then take out the conveyor belt, namely those railway tracks that took transports of Jews by a spring of 1944 at a rate of 12 to 15,000 people every day. Take out those railway lines. And yet that didn't happen. Why not? Roosevelt in Washington. Well, it was a combination of, I would say, of practical objections to do with how you bomb, when you bomb, day, night time, which Air Force had the capacity and so on. The Brits said, we don't, we only bomb at die by night. This has to be done by day. Ask the Americans. The Americans thought about it and Roosevelt said he was very uncomfortable. He, he thought if the United States is bombing railway tracks, then there will be some Jews killed and therefore uh, we will be implicated in this whole horrible business, he told one aide. So there was that. But there was also prejudice played a part. There was a degree of anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish prejudice, which meant the report encountered uh, incredulity, which said, you know, in the words of one um, London official, we have to allow for a degree of Jewish exaggeration. Uh, was one response. There was an army publication in the United States that saw this report that had been smuggled out against all odds at great cost and said, mm, we think this is too Semitic an account. Uh, mm -hmm. and We would like something we, you know, which is less Jewish. Uh, we would like to hear about war crimes the way the victims are not Jews. Um, there was an official in London who said, I think we have done enough for these wailing Jews. So there was anti-Semitism. There was practical problems, but the number one problem, and this did not was not confined just to the Allied leaders, that the report encountered was straightforward incredulity. There were human beings, Jews among them, who simply could not believe the horror they were reading about. They went into a kind of, now we would say, a state of denial, where they thought this is just too awful to be true. Even if I believe it, I can't absorb it. I can't act on it because it's too much to to take in. And that was the response that was in, in, in several quarters. And yet I think it's the one response that Rudy p p with Fred as young escapees never bargained for. Well, Rudy did get the word out. He got the word out to the highest authorities. They didn't necessarily do much about it. Are you able to conclude then whether or not his original mission namely to save more Jews from ending up in Auschwitz, was accomplished. It wasn't accomplished to the extent he wanted, because he wanted desperately for the warning to get out before the Jews of Hungary were taken to Auschwitz. They were the last community left in Europe who had not been pulled into the Nazi inferno. And they wanted to save the Jews of Hungary, Fred and Rudy. They got the report out in time. It could have happened. And yet it was not passed to the Jews of Hungary themselves. And that really preoccupied Rudolf Verber for the rest of his life, because 437,000 Jews of Hungary 
were sent to their deaths. That said, the report was published. It made it into the Swiss press in late June of 1944, and a series of diplomatic moves followed that led ultimately to the regent, the de facto ruler of Hungary, uh, issuing an edict to halt the deportation of the Jews just in time to save the 200,000 Jews of Budapest, the capital, before they could be deported to Auschwitz, which is why I say that Rudolf Werber, together with Fred Wetzler, can be credited with saving an astonishing 200,000 Jewish lives, an achievement which I think means Rudolf Werber ranks alongside Anne Frank or Oskar Schindler or Primo Levi as that group of Jews whose stories define or should define our understanding of the Holocaust. To me, he is a towering figure of this period, a hero of this period, who has not had the recognition he deserves. Well, he's getting it now, thanks to you, and appropriately so. Let's, uh, Jonathan, fast forward the story a bit, because there's a Canadian angle to this story. Uh, Rudy, of course, after the war is over, uh, he does marry, not a particularly happy marriage. He gets married and does have a couple of daughters. We've got a picture of him with his two kids here. There they are, Zuza and Helena. And he eventually becomes a professor at the University of British Columbia in Western Canada. And, and I guess I, I can say this here, I saw him when he, when he was an expert witness at the Zundel trials in Toronto. This would have been back in the uh, 1980s. How significant was he in the case of that propagandist and ultimately uh, hate monger, Ernst Zundel? He was hugely central, um, uh, uh, and he was the, Rudolf Herber was the star witness uh, for the prosecution, in effect, against this Holocaust denier, Ernst Sindel. Uh, he was on the stand for hour after hour after hour, partly because of what we talked about earlier, which is that he was this ultra witness. He was this man with a panoramic view of what had happened uh, in Auschwitz, and the prosecutors understood that, that he was somebody who could testify to every aspect of the Nazi killing machine. You know, most survivors, look, most Jews who were brought to Auschwitz had a life expectancy measured in hours. Even those who survived were often there only for a matter of weeks, a couple of months, maybe three months when they were liberated. To have somebody who had been there for two years and had worked in place after place after place made him an extraordinary witness, and he was a wonderful performer in the courtroom. He had a, you know, huge, we haven't talked about how deeply charismatic a man Rudolf Verbal was. But in these years, these last three decades of his life, he lived in Canada. He made a second marriage to uh, um, uh, his wife, Robin Verbal, lived quite a, a sort of uh, found a kind of degree of happiness that had eluded him before then. But he would often be called to testify in trials of Nazi war criminals uh, uh, as an expert, and, and as both an expert and a witness. He was both at once. He'd been there, but he also had this deep knowledge uh, of it. And in the case of that Holocaust denier who was found guilty, uh, Rudolf Werber was really a central figure in making sure that justice was done in that case. And I think in, you know, in the Canada of the 1980s, there would have been people following that trial, which you covered, who would have known his name. But, but more largely, he you know, was allowed to slip into relative obscurity that not, you know, outside his specialist historian circles, people didn't really know his name. Well, he died almost uh, 20 years ago, I guess. And, and one way you describe him in the book, why don't we finish up on this, is he was not a Holocaust survivor that, quote, unquote, met expectations. In fact, when he talked about those days, he often had a, a, a curious smile on his face. Did you ever get to the bottom of why he, why he was not what you would expect for a Holocaust survivor? Yeah, I mean, he would unnerve interviewers. He did have this manner uh, which, you know, he would be smiling at the kind of bitter irony of it. There was a sardonic humor there. He saw, he had a very, you know, he, he saw the black humor in what he was describing. And one interviewer famously, Claude Landsman, maker of the film Shoah, said to him, why do you smile when you speak about these events? And he said, do you prefer I should cry? It was, you know, he, he saw the kind of black human comedy in a way that what human beings are capable of and thought you either fold, you know, curl up and, uh, and weep and die at that or you live on. 
but he was also powered by something which I think we're uncomfortable imagining in Holocaust survivors, even though it's in a way it's so obvious, which is anger. He was angry at the people, the Nazis who had done this to him and his fellow Jews, but also to those people who had failed to pass on his warning. He and Fred had done the hard part. They had managed to do what was all but impossible as Jews, which was to escape from the hardest place in Europe to escape from. They had smuggled out this report, crossing marshland and forests and rivers, evading Nazi bullets to get back to Slovakia. They'd managed to type out this report of extraordinary feat of memory. Rudolf had a, a, a phenomenal memory. And yet there were people who did not pass on his warning, Jewish leaders in some cases in Hungary, and did not act on his warning. And we can think there of allied leaders. And that he could not forgive. You know, the title of his memoir that he wrote in 1963 was I Cannot Forgive. And he could not forgive those people who had failed those 437,000 Jews he believed could have been saved if they had been warned in advance. And that made him an uncomfortable witness. He was not somebody who would give you, uh, who would talk in very sort of healing, consoling platitudes about, you know, man being ultimately good to his fellow man. He had a message of anger and fury. And that made him somebody people were wary of inviting onto public platforms. And that partly explains why he's not as well known as I think he should be. Well, Jonathan, if I may say, you've done exemplary work to bring his story to the public. The escape artist, the man who broke out of Auschwitz to warn the world, is a tremendous and important read. And we're glad that it's brought Jonathan Friedland, columnist for The Guardian, to TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Something, or more likely someone, became a media sensation. You found out all the gory details about whatever put them in the headlines. Then the story fades and life goes on. So did you or did you not really get the whole story? Sarah Marshall's award-winning podcast, You're Wrong About, makes the case over and over that you did not. Sarah Marshall joins us now from Portland, Oregon for more. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, First off, congratulations. You hit five years uh, of doing your podcast, You're Wrong About. What does it mean? Did you, did you think this was going to happen? You know, what does it mean to have hit that benchmark? I mean, I, I guess it means that we haven't run out of stories, <laughs> and I don't think that we ever will. Um, and I think, it, I mean, it means that we found something to do. I've been able to find something to do where I can... Uh, do what I love for a living, which is everybody's dream. And what I love to do is to, you know, get into a research hole to get documents and uh, newspaper articles and kind of look at what people were talking about at the time. And often, you know, not to not to position myself as this this fabulous researcher, because often the truth is a few inches below the surface. Um, and I think that what has made the show last is that people like hearing these stories, not because it makes them feel like they're being scolded, but because it makes them feel more forgiving of themselves and each other and feel closer to humanity, I think. <laughs> Tell us, for, for some of the viewers who may not be familiar with your podcast, this launched in 2018. Tell us the backstory. Why did you launch You're Wrong About in the first place? Yeah. So I, the podcast started because Michael Hobbs, a fantastic journalist, um, approached me and said he wanted to do a podcast about misremembered history. He specifically wanted to do a show about 90s media phenomena, which I love. And I asked if we could have all of history available because I wanted to someday do an episode on Leopold and Loeb. Um, and he had read an article I'd written on Tanya Harding where basically I had gone just gone through sort of the information we had available and, and pointed out what seems in retrospect to be extremely obvious, which is that this was a story that was being sold as a broad comedy, and yet there was a lot, lot of tragedy in it. 1994 was a time when you could allege very serious domestic abuse and the public could just kind of laugh at you. Mm -hmm. um, and there didn't have to be a segment of the, the conversation about you that took any of it seriously. Um, and so I felt like I had a ton of stories when he approached me that I wanted to tell that were like that, where it felt like there was just a bigger story than the media had the room to depict because there was uh, 
the voice that got to be heard, you know, there was really just like one voice um, that people got to experience describing these stories they wanted to hear. There wasn't space for a lot of pushback on it. And now with the media landscape we have, it's brought in a lot of complexity. And I think this is one of the positive complexities we have that we can go back and try and do justice to stories that the, uh, the story was flattened into simplicity at the time when we first tried to understand them. I'm hoping you can pull back the curtain in terms of uh, the, the producing that goes behind it, the mm -hmm. research that goes behind it. How do you select your topics and your guests? Uh, because for the longest time you, you did have Michael uh, on the other side mm -hmm. of the seat, but now we have guests who come on uh, regularly. So tell us sort of the thought process behind topics. I'm sure your, your viewers are throwing topics at you left, right, and center, like do this next, do this next. But what yeah. is the, what's the actual process? I mean, I, it, it definitely is a gut thing. And if I'm doing the research, then it has to be based on whether I can kind of get into a headspace of just feeling committed enough and passionate enough um, to, to get in there and do the work that you have to do uh, to really find new information or to kind of see what was hiding in plain sight. And so I think choosing, learning how to choose guests in the, the post mic world has been, like that was a real challenge to try and figure out what criteria we needed for the guests that we had because the you know the thing about Mike and I that I think really drew people to the show initially was that we had this great rapport and that we were talking about history in a serious way and in a thoughtful way but that we also were really gossiping with each other mm. and that we had this tone of like what we are talking about is sad but the experience of sharing it with you and trying to make meaning with you is joyful um, and I think that was why people remained attached to the show is because they went to it to know that they were going to learn and learn things that potentially made them uncomfortable, but to have a good time listening to friends. And so I think, you know, the people that I have on now, um, I love it when it's somebody who's passionate about a topic, who's kind of speaking with their heart as well as their brain. And also when it's, you know, somebody who I can kind of find a space in a conversation with, you know, to feel like we are making something bigger than the sum of our parts as two individuals. Um, and, you know, a recent example that jumps to mind is we just had Alison McCabe on talking about um, her new book on Sinead O'Connor. And that's mm -hmm. something that uh, listeners have been asking for since the beginning. And I've always known it was a good idea and just the moment wasn't right for me to be the person to tell that story. And then Allison came along and was the right person. And I loved doing that episode. Awesome. I want to give our viewers an idea of what the show sounds like. I have another great mm -hmm. example. Here's you talking about the case of Kitty Genovese with your former co-host, Michael Hobbs. Have a listen. Do you have any sense of when this happened? I was thinking about this last night and thinking like, was it the 1890s or was it like the 1960s? <laughs> I can't even place this in geologic time. Do you know what city it is? New York City. It's, it's in New York. Yeah, this is a story about a real life woman who became a metaphor. Ooh. And this happened in New York City in 1964. Okay. And it happened in Queens. Oh. Is that surprising? No, I mean, I said, oh, because it seemed like you needed a reaction, but it seems like like, all right, that's a part of that's a part of New York that I've never been to. I know we're talking about a murder and a very famous murder, but you guys have a great time on the show, and it's it's very obvious there. I do want to pick up on that murder case. Why was that murder case ripe for a reexamination? Yeah, um, it's it's really nostalgic to hear that tape, by the way, because I don't <laughs> listen to old episodes that much. But I'm like, oh yeah, we had. There's like a Peter and the Wolf quality there. I'm the cello and, <laughs> and he's the timpani. It's really lovely. Um, so Kitty Genovese um, was a a woman who, as as we heard in that clip, kind of became a symbol of something uh, both bigger than herself and, and counter to what her life was really about because she was murdered by a random assailant um, while walking home from work uh, in 1964 this initially wasn't reported on very much. Um, and something that didn't come out until much later was that Kitty Genovese, incredibly for the time, uh, was living her life as a lesbian. She had a partner. She was at, you know, she loved her sexuality, um, as far as we can tell, in a time when it was all about violence and shame. And so her murder was um, something that became famous because the New York Times, with information fed to them by the police 
published it as a story about it wasn't about her murder necessarily as much as about this idea that there had been so many witnesses to the crime and all of them uh, had either been indifferent to it or kind of enjoyed it. There was the the idea being sold that New Yorkers were so morally bankrupt that they watched murders for fun. <laughs> um, and this was a story that spread around the world. It was a story my mother told me when I was an adolescent girl, kind of explaining to me the limitations that had to be placed on my life because you're a girl, girls are born to be victims, and in New York City, they kill people for fun. Um, and what turned out to be the case was that this was a murder that happened in the week. There, there were so many factors that went into what happened. It happened in the middle of the night. Very few people had a clear view of any of it. The people who could see something didn't see enough to convince them that what they saw was dangerous. Some people saw the um, assault begin in front of a bar, which made them believe that it was a marital dispute and therefore not their business because a stranger is not allowed to assault a woman, but her husband or boyfriend is. Um, and the person who had, you know, people tried to call the police. There was no 911 yet. Uh, NYPD is famous for being jerks, and that was the case at the time as well. And the one person who had the best view of the murder uh, was a gay man and who had a man who had every reason to be terrified of what the police would do to him. And then kind of in the last contradiction in Ketty Genovese's dying moments, a friend of hers who lived in the building rushed out at great personal risk and held her as she died. So it was not a story of indifference, but a story of social systems not working about homophobia and, and violence against uh, queer New Yorkers and about the police not doing their job and the media helping them to cover it up, which um, is scarier, actually. I want to talk about another episode, your first episode. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on the <laughs> satanic panic of the 80s and 90s. But more so, you know, why are moral panics so prevalent in American culture? That's a great question. I mean, I think one of the things I think about moral panics is that they allow us to register our sense that something is wrong um, and then to aim our our concern in the wrong direction, basically. So the, you know, the satanic pa panic came along at a time when this is very hard to remember now, but this was the beginning of the realization aided in large part by feminism of the 1970s that child sexual abuse was endemic. It wasn't just something that happened to you. It was something that was happening in so many households um, and that so many people were living with as, as a secret or as something that was supposed to not, not be as big a deal to them as it clearly was. And I think that when the broader culture started to catch up with that knowledge, um, the uh, one of the obvious next things to do was to think, well, you know, we're living in a society where women and children are extremely dependent on men as wage earners. Maybe think maybe abuse could be mitigated if it were easier to leave the home if you found out that abuse was happening and if you're husband or your parents, your your child's parent uh, was committing abuse. Um, it was a moment when we were attempting to pass the ERA. Um, we were trying to kind of create a world where if men are abusive, then they maybe, we can dream of a future where they don't have so much free reign to abuse and where people, you know, where the women and children who they are abusing have nowhere to go. And the response that the culture in the United States, specifically also in the moment when kind of evangelical Christianity was working its way into government, um, the response that we had instead was to say, the family is fine, Satanists are the problem, <laughs> lesbians are the problem. And we don't have to look at any of the way society is organized. Everything we're doing is great, but there are Satanists and we have to look at them. And so I think that, you know, in that case and many others, moral panics, I think, are appealing to us because they allow us to imagine that the threat is far away as opposed to somewhere inside the house. All right. I want you to help me examine uh, media stories, the current media stories. Has the media oh gotten better at examining stories with more nuance than it did in the past? I... I mean, oh my God, I don't know. I wish I had a, a stronger opinion. I feel like 
there's so much more space for uh, for different voices. There's so much space for countervailing opinions and for people to kind of poke holes in kind of obvious falsehoods and stories that we see um, in mainstream media. But at the same time, the kind of the size and the pressure of the misinformation that people have to deal with is so tremendous that I wonder um, I wonder if we've made progress. I think it really depends who you are. I think that if you are um, if you are feeling critical of what you see and if you want to kind of think more complexly about what's going on and go in search of that, then I think there's so much more available to you and it's so much easier to get. Um, but there's, yeah, the the speed at which information travels has um, has not only brought us great things, I think. Uh, with that being said, is there a story in the last year or two that you said, hey, I'm gonna bookmark that and we're gonna revisit this conversation in a couple of years because there is something missing here. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's funny because I look at stories that happen now and I feel like um, what needs to be said is being said and it isn't, um, it doesn't have the power to affect things the way we might have once uh, dreamed that, you know, I think I, I, in maybe a very childlike way, used to imagine that the truth had a power of its own and that if the truth could only get out, and people could hear it, then they would kind of stop what they were doing and, and understand the power of um, of just the sort of rationality that was reaching them. And yet we can see, you know, specifically in the U.S. currently in the way that we are creating legislation about trans kids and about criminalizing people's gender and sexuality, um, like that's a story that everybody not everybody, but I think a lot of people understand exactly what's going on and are powerless to stop it, um, or at least feel powerless in the moment. And yeah, there are stories. Um, I think the thing that I love doing about the show too is that with with smaller stories and kind of celebrity stories, um, I am like everybody else. I kind of get swept along by the dominant narrative at the time. And then it takes a little while for me to look back and say, you know, what did I miss? And that's why I love doing a history show. Now we've seen quite a few films, podcasts, and TV shows do what you do in, in re recent years. How do you feel about this sort of trend? I think it's great. I mean, I think that uh, we have a guest star. I like it. <laughs> um, I think that there's, you know, when I was initially trying to pitch the stories that the the podcast ended up being all about, the response that I got typically from editors was like, well, who cares if we did a bad job covering Amy Fisher? That's not, it's not interesting to talk about what we could have done differently with Amy Fisher. This is not Quantum Leap. Um, and I think what the success of you know, of you're wrong about and of then, you know, the other forms of media that are kind of trying to do the same task, kind of look back and look at the these figures that everybody knows who they are and yet doesn't know them at all. Um, I, I like that we recognize that this is very compelling, like I always knew and now more people know. I love that. Um, Pamela Anderson criticized the FX series <laughs> Pam and Tommy, which portrayed, of course, mm -hmm. a fictionalized version of uh, her sex tape scandal from the 1990s. Can revisionist history get things wrong sometimes? Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, I think that this is like we're in a weird area, too, right? Where like we I think the kind of journey is that you realize that people are interested in revisionist history and then once we know that there's an interest in something, then we start to see, you know, the understanding on behalf of people who have these jobs that old tabloid stories can be monetized into new limited series and TV shows and movies and whatever else. Um, and, and those overproduced podcasts that ABC makes. And, you know, what happens with that, unfortunately, is that like tabloid stories of, of the olden times were crafted the way that they were because when human beings read the news, we don't want facts, we want a story. And we, you know, journalists at various times and in various um, industries, myself included, inevitably are incentivized to streamline a story, to make someone's life more satisfying because it feels like a narrative rather than just a collection of stuff that happened. Um, and I think that, you know, without narrative, we can't, it's harder for us to learn and it's harder for us to remember and feel moved. But 
there is kind of a side of narrative making where you kind of understand um, how do I please this crowd? What is the most crowd pleasing story that I could tell? And the problem with that is that in tabloids in the past and now in you know TV shows and movies that we make of those stories, today the end result is the same, which is that often stories that uh, simplify characters, make them into archetypes that we feel familiar and comfortable with as, as opposed to sort of humans in their full complexity. Um, those are the stories that are easier to invest in because it's easier to believe that they'll make money. And I think that that's how people who have been flattened before end up flattened still. Sarah Marshall, you have a show, a live show at the Danforth Music Hall in Toronto this Sunday. Uh, thank you so much and good luck with another fantastic year ahead of you. <laughs> thank you so much. This was a delight. The Agenda's Week in Review revisits our conversation with Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen and explores the security of our energy infrastructure. At what point does it actually sink in with you that you're going to be the first Canadian ever to take a shot at the moon? Yeah, I, I think it maybe hasn't completely sunk in. Certainly every once in a while, you know, I'll, I'll look up at the moon and I'll be like, wow, I'm like really going there. And I, I kind of have to convince myself that it's true and it's really happening. You know, right now it just seems like it's words, but I know, I mean, we're, we're already been working on it. We're starting to dig into some of this stuff. I've got emails about training plans and uh, yeah, Canada's really going to the moon. It's incredible. And tell us about the main goal of your Artemis II mission. Yeah, so Artemis II will be the first time we fly humans on this new spacecraft called Orion, which we will need for future space or for missions to the lunar surface. But this mission will be to buy down the risk to do that testing of this capsule and we'll fly it around, we'll leave Earth, we'll orbit the Earth a couple of times. So it'll take about 24 hours to do that, check out all the systems. And then once we're convinced it's ready for deep space, then we're gonna um, we're gonna take it around the moon, one lap around the moon to be about a ten day mission total. We're gonna do manual flying, manual piloting of the spacecraft um, to assess its docking capabilities. We're gonna test out its life support equipment. We're gonna test out exercise methodology and just figure out how to do um, exploration in deep space again. How well do you know the other members of the crew? Oh, I know my crew really well. Uh, Reed Wiseman and I were classmates. We joined the astronaut corps at the same time. So I've been down here in Houston with him since 2009. We went through all our basic training together. He's one of my best friends. Um, and then uh, Victor and Christina, they were the class after us. So we're actually pretty close. Uh, we spent a lot of time together socially since they joined the Corps, and I've worked with them tons professionally. I've got a great deal of respect for everybody on the crew. For missions to actually be successful, do you have to like the members that you're going to be up there with? I don't think that that's an absolute criteria. Of course, professionally, you could work through something like that. And that won't be an issue in our case. In fact, you know, even in our core, our broader astronaut, our international astronaut core. So Canada has four active astronauts, but we're part of a, a much larger core, over 60 astronauts down here in Houston. And uh, we spend a lot of time on that because although you could get the mission done, we've come to recognize that if you're firing on all cylinders, if you're really working on those team skills, you know, empathy, taking care of one another, um, those things really do matter for ultimate performance. And that's really what we're shooting for. We're trying to maximize performance of our team. And does the same crew remain intact for Artemis III? No, no, definitely not. There'll be another crew assigned to Artemis 3. Even before we fly Artemis 2, there'll be a second crew coming behind us and, and ready to take on that next challenge of sending humans back to the moon. I think it's an important point. You know, Artemis 2 is, is meant to be just one next step. It's not a pinnacle, uh, certainly not a pinnacle in the Artemis program. And I think what's important for Canadians to recognize is this is like not the end for us either. I mean, this is just where we've gotten after decades and we're aiming much, much higher. You know, definitely I won't be satisfied if we don't see a Canadian walk on the moon at some point in the future. And, uh, and then on to Mars. Canada has a lot to offer. It's one of the things I've been sharing is, you know, it's, it's tremendous American leadership to create a program that makes space for the international partnership. Um, but 
it's Canada's can do attitude that has stepped up and taken advantage of that opportunity and is delivering tremendous value. I mean, I am so proud of what I have seen Canadians accomplish across our country over the past 14 years that I've been in the space program. I know they have a lot more to give. Well, let me pick up on one part of that answer you gave, which is the you said you'd be ticked off if at some point a Canadian doesn't get to walk on the moon again. And <laughs> and I have to believe, Jeremy, you're going to forgive me for this. I have to believe that there's a small part of you or maybe a big part of you that's thinking, I'm going to get so close to the bloody moon and I don't actually get to walk on the moon. Man, am I ticked off. Am I close on that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think you're close at all. I mean, I absolutely, I'll always want to walk on the moon and I may walk on the moon one day, you know, never say never. Um, but right now, I'm truly, authentically, uh, very pleased and happy to be part of this test flight. This, this may not look like a big challenge because we're not landing on the moon, but it is. Earlier this year, we did put out a cyber flash to critical infrastructure partners within Canada, uh, talking about a, an incident that we were aware of where a critical infrastructure operator had been compromised by a threat actor. And in this situation, the threat actor had the potential to actually cause physical damage by the access that they had. So it's very important for us to flag that, uh, to take the information that we learned from the incident and actually share that with critical infrastructure operators uh, across Canada. Bushan, I want to come to you. Uh, in terms of, give us an idea, is the oil and gas sector routinely targeted by cyber criminals and, and state-backed leaders, or hackers rather? Well, it is, uh, and you know, we're uh, being critical infrastructure always uh, a source of um, attack. But I can confirm that uh, Enbridge was not hacked or breached, and we do maintain a very strong partnership uh, and collaboration with uh, the government, so with the Canadian as well as the U.S. Uh, security agencies. And part of this is all about making sure that we are sharing the threat intelligence uh, in a more proactive manner so we can take uh, proactive action to address or mitigate any threats. So just want to confirm that uh, Enbridge is not the natural gas company at the center of, of this breach. That is right. All right. Stephanie, uh, the last, one of the last times you were on the program, we've, we you were talking about uh, pipelines and, and, and uh, the Colonial Pipeline in specific, one that was uh, a, a successful cyber attack, a victim of. Give us an idea. Cyber criminals, do they look at oil and gas? Is this an industry that uh, is normally targeted? Yeah, that Colonial Pipeline attack, it, it's different from what this alleged attack uh, actually is. In that particular case, it was a ransomware attack, and I don't believe it actually hit the industrial control systems or the systems that basically control the pressure, the flow, the distribution of oil. And it, it seems to, I think, of attack kind of the billing department. Um, and so it, it's a very different kind of attack. It's where um, basically criminals are able to encrypt uh, information and then stop uh, computers from working and, and those kinds of things, then you have to pay a ransom in order to get basically your data back or access to your uh, computers back. In this particular case, what's being alleged is something far more serious. It is something that could have potentially, um, as you as been said, caused physical destruction, right? Mm -hmm. So something that could have caused an explosion. Um, some of the uh, media reports on this uh, you know, a leak basically suggests that this could have potentially even have caused loss of life. So what we're talking about here is an actual kind of physical attack. And you know, to to your point, this is something that does happen regularly uh, in the sector, not or at least attempts to do this happen in the sector. We, we've been, I think, fairly lucky. Um, the intelligence reports allegedly say that the that this would, if, if this success had. If this attack had been successful, it would have been the first time we would have seen something like an industrial control system successfully attacked by Russia. But you know, even going back 10 years ago, there was the uh, Telvent incident, right? Which was a uh, an attack. It's you know, it's allegedly China was able to actually get into the smart grid of uh, Telvent's pipelines, uh, which could have caused similar kinds of damage in terms of, of flows and things like this. That fortunately was detected and stopped. At the time, but it goes to show that you know the, these kinds of attacks, aspirational or successful, um, have been plotted for now well over a decade. All right, let's add some international context into this, Rajiv. I'm hoping you can explain how does the the Russian war in Ukraine uh, factor into these threats. 
Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, the geopolitical tensions that we saw there and then the original, the actual conflict itself was certainly something that we tracked carefully at the Cyber Center. So, I mean, threats to oil and gas can come from a number of different sources. So they can be from cyber criminals, right? They want to make money because they can, you know, basically ransomware a cyber, a, 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 a gas company and then have them pay money because they can't afford to be down. It can come from hacktivists, right? It can come from espionage. They want to learn uh, information about the gas company or its exploration and whatnot. But in, in this case here, we're looking at the geopolitical context and what states do is they tend to preposition or perform reconnaissance against uh, oil and gas companies and other energy organizations uh, as well. And we've been warning about that in, from the Cyber Center since about 2018 in our first national cyber threat assessment. So we've been upping those warnings uh, year after year. Um, it's a way of projection of power for the states. And when you start to get into geopolitical conflict, um, the stakes just rise yeah, even higher, right? So if you look back to before the conflict, in December, we had put out, uh, like this is 2021, we, we made a conscious effort to actually talk about ransomware. And we actually had four ministers sign an open letter to Canadians talking about the threat of ransomware. And as you know, there are many you know ransomware groups that are Russian in, in this space. Those are just two of the stories we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations on our website, tbo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, April 21st, 2023, Monday, where things stand on $10 a day childcare in this province. I'm Jane Jagnathan. Thanks for watching TBO and for joining us online at tbo.org. Have a great weekend and Steve, we'll see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.